morning. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, it is again Sabbath. And again, Lord, we have the opportunity to come together and worship. We pray for strength. Lord, we have the days just ahead of us are going to be tricky ones, Lord. Help us to have faith in you, Father that we may be your servants, your soldiers. Be with us, that we may study and learn what we should do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're in a period of time where it seems one page of our prophet's writings after another is just coming to life. And I find it interesting that many people, oh, I don't want to hear about it. Don't tell me. Oh, I know that the prophet said this, but we don't have to talk about it. Folks, that's a very dangerous situation and tack to take. What did Jesus say to the disciples on his way to Gethsemane? What did he say? When I say that, I mean through his walk. Just prior to that, he said, there are many things I wish to tell you, but I can't. You don't want to hear them. I am going to be taken. I am going to be crucified. I am going to die. You don't want to hear it. And you will be sleeping on the ground when it happens. We don't have that option. We don't have that option. I've recently been rereading the last five chapters of the Great Controversy. Especially paying attention to, especially paying attention to, Satan's plans. They're all in there. The snares of Satan, the deception. Instead, what are we doing as a people? Where are our attentions? What's going on in the church? Folks, I don't care. Was Jesus concerned with what was going on in the church at his time? Or was he more concerned about what was just before the church? I really don't care what's going on in the church. I can't do anything about it. Not one thing. I'm not saying I don't care about the people. That's not what I'm saying. What did Jesus say was the motivating power or who was the, be, of the church in his day? Who did he say was the father of the Pharisees? We don't have any Pharisees today, though. We don't have any scribes today. We don't have any Sadducees. So we're safe from that. Satan... Did Jesus say Satan was going around at his time as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour? Oh, he was, but that lion got a lot bigger and a lot more hungry right now. Oh, I don't want to hear about the death and destruction. These are pages off the great controversy. So what you're saying in essence is, I don't want to hear what Jesus has to tell me. Why did he warn us about these things? Were the disciples more concerned about the end of the Pharisaical error and the destruction of the temple? Were they worried more about that than the furthering of the gospel message when they asked Jesus when the temple would be destroyed? What were they more concerned with? Themselves. That's right. Where a position they would have. We're studying in Ephesians about faith. Six. We're looking at the armor of God. And it's coming down to the point, and Paul gives us a, 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 a very severe warning here. And we talked about the other things, but he talks about, in verse 16 of Ephesians 6, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall quench the fiery darts of the wicked. He's saying, what's the most important part of this? Above all, what does that mean? 
the tornadoes, the tsunamis, the devastation, the destruction. They're fiery darts, folks. When I looked at what I saw last night, on, and that's why I didn't look at the news. Oh, well, you didn't see it on the news? No, I don't want to look at the news because they're only going to show me what they want me to see. That's a controlled environment. Your mind is being controlled. I'm not telling people not to wait. Fox or CNN, it doesn't matter. It's all choreographed. I went to the Internet and looked around for some independent private reports, and you hear what Reginald had to say. There, remember, this government says, don't let a crisis go to waste. Would you call this a crisis? Isn't this what this administration has said time and time again? They're going to use it. To do what? To further their agenda. We were warned about this. This is where faith comes in. The disciples said, oh no, don't say those things, Jesus. Isn't that what they said to him? When we try and talk about them, you're going to, I don't want to talk about that. Isn't that the same spirit? Or should we have our shield of faith and talk about it from the point of view that Jesus wants us to understand about it? See, there's a big difference. Jesus said that many shall faint from fear. But see to it that you are not alarmed. I am telling you this beforehand, he said. What does that mean? Are we supposed to know about this stuff or ignore it? We're supposed to know about it because we're supposed to know how to deal with it. Not just for our own selves. And I am telling you, this very thing that just occurred, who are they going to start blaming for this? The faithful. The faithful. But he said, many hearts shall fail for fear. What do you think he meant by that? If you can't discuss this and deal with it in the light of prophecy, how are you going to handle it when they start pointing the finger at you? What are you going to say? I don't know this man. Isn't that what Peter said? I'll die for you, he said. But when the finger got pointed at him because Peter wasn't prepared because Jesus said, I can't tell you these things. You don't want to hear them. What did he do? What did he do? Did he get a second chance? We're not going to. If we deny Christ when the finger gets pointed, what's going to happen? You're going to receive the mark of the beast right then and there. Peter got a second chance. We're not going to. We've had it all through our life. Because we have all... That's why Paul says the shield above all, the shield of faith. And what is the shield of faith? It's right there, that piece of gold on the miter. The protecting of the mind through the law of God. You're not going to escape this. There are those running to the mountains, storing up ammunition and food. They know exactly where you are. They've got GPS hidden in your underwear. I'm using that as an example. You don't know where they have tags in the possessions you own. You will not get away from it. And not only that, who knows where you are 24-7? The devil. You can't hide. You can go to the center of the earth. He's got his hound dogs. There they are. You're not going to hide. You're not going to hide. You're not going to avoid it. One way or another, you're going to deal with it. You're either going to be part of the problem or part of the solution. You will not hide. Let me show you something. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm just going to say this, then we're going to move on. The birth certificate issue. There is no doubt that this man is an American citizen. By the Constitution, by definition, simply because his mother was an American. Done. Doesn't matter if he was born in the middle of Russia or China. It doesn't matter. 
Don't you think this is a smokescreen? With all the issues we have going on, this is all they've got to talk about? Takes your mind away from where... Were the disciples' minds distracted when Christ was here? What were they worried about? Position in the world. What is this all about? Who's going to control? Who's position? This, there are so many distractions out there, and they're piling. And you watch the news, and they pile more. Now the, the, the race issue is really coming up. You ain't seen riots yet. You haven't seen riots yet, because they're stoking that fire like crazy. Have you heard about it? Have you been hearing about it? When the great controversy tells us about chaos, like has never been before, Every wind of doctrine shall blow. Isn't that what we're told? That's a wind of doctrine, folks. A powerful one. So, the shield of faith. We were looking in the Old Testament at Josiah the last time. How he died. And we were in 2 Kings 23, we had seen he went to a battle he shouldn't have gone to. He was warned not to go. Who warned him? Who warned him not to go to that battle? The king of Egypt. He sent a runner to him. He said, the Lord has told me to tell you not to go. What did Josiah dismiss that as? No, well, God didn't tell me, he said. God did not, so he was doing his own will. His shield of faith was gone at that point. And then, at one point in time, if he did even realize that he shouldn't have been there, why did he not turn back? What, Reginald? Pride. What would his men say? His faith was gone. Could God deal with that pride? Could God have dealt with that situation if Josiah had said, no, you know what, I'm doing wrong. I think his men would have thought more of him. And I want to pick it up from there in uh, 2 Kings. I just want to read uh, Mrs. White's commentary and then uh, we're going to move on. She says here, and this would be for those of you who have the study Bibles, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible, 2 Kings 23, and this is her commentary, and we had read this last time, under verses 29 and 30. Those who will not take God's word as assurance need not hope that human wisdom can help them. What is this world dealing, running on right now? Is God in play, or is it human wisdom? Now, I made a statement prior that since Ronald Reagan, every president has come from Yale or Harvard. Never, ever before has this country had such a small field to choose from. What are these institutions considered to be? The elitist of the elite of the elite. Human wisdom. For human wisdom, aside from God's, is like the waves of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. The word of Christ is, he shall guide you into all truth. Reject not the light given. Now I want to pause there. And I want to go to Matthew 5. There was the same situation that occurred, or was occurring, back in Jesus' time. Matthew 5, verses 13, well we all know this. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Is it therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot? You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hit. And it, Jesus goes on to talk about light. But I want to read Mrs. White's commentary on this. In his teachings, Christ likened his disciple to, uh, disciples to to objects most familiar to them. He compared them to salt and to light. Well, we're pretty familiar with that. One way or another with salt, 
but we all know what light is. You are the salt of the earth, he said. You are the light of the world. These words were spoken to a few poor, humble fishermen. Priests and rabbis were in the congregation of hearers, but these were not the ones addressed. With all their learning and all their supposed instruction in the mysteries of the law, with all their claims to know God, they revealed that they did not know him. Where was their faith, folks? Were these the men that the disciples were so concerned about offending? Where, what were they looking at? What had confused their faith? So-called education. These leading men had been committed to the or to these leading men had been committed the or oracles of God, but Christ declared them to be unsafe teachers. He said to them, "Ye teach for doctrine the commandments of men. You do err, er, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God." Turning from these men to the humble fishermen, he said, "You are the salt of the earth." Is that not the exact situation today? We have great learned people running our organizations, whether it be secular or religious. And what did they come to the conclusion thereof? What is the conclusion, the consensus of all the learned men and women of this world in regards to the ruling and religious care of this world. What have they come to? What is their consensus? Who's the religious leader of this world? Who? The Pope. Are they blind guides? Are they not teaching their own doctrines? Their own laws? And they are going to go there, take the next step into saying that if you don't bow to him, you're going to die. See, folks, the truth just doesn't matter anymore. When you teach doctrinal uh, uh, errors, when you teach lies, knowing they're lies, when you close your eyes to the truth so that what you learned is more important, then you teach everything and anything but the truth. And you become so deceived yourself, you don't know what the truth is anymore. What is that called when you believe your own lies? Self-deceptive, but you're pathological in your lies at that point, aren't you? You don't even know. You start believing your own lies. How many people out there today believe that man is going to solve the problems in this world? How many Seventh-day Adventists believe that there's going to be a political solution to the problems in this country? The vast majority of them. Was there any difference between Jesus' time and our time? Now, who would be the salt of the earth today and the light? The unlearned? Those who have never been to the schools that perpetuate this garbage? And we break our necks and we break our bank accounts to send our kids into these educational systems. And what do we get back? I don't care whose stamp is over the door. Because the Seventh-day Adventist Church is now teaching homosexuality and evolution into schools. Without exception. One way or another. That's why I say, I don't care what goes on in a church. I can't do anything about it. Now, can I make a difference as to what goes on in the world? Yes. They want to believe men. They want to believe the wisdom that comes from this fallen, mutated mess called man. We are pushing the Holy Spirit away from this planet. Can the devil make a tornado? Can he make a tornado, a hurricane? Let me see. She says, 
He's been studying these things for thousands of years. And he has mastered, she says, in the great controversy. You've all read it. The ability to create storms, to steer them. What stops them? Why do you suppose they don't know how many tornadoes touch down? They have an estimate. They don't know. It's like Homestead when that tornado came, or hurricane came through there uh, and devastated the southern tip of Florida. What was the name of that hurricane uh, back in the early 90s? Andrew. Andrew. That's right, Nellie. It was Andrew. They had to close the Air Force base down there because there was so much damage to it. They said that it had winds in excess of 180 miles an hour, but the wind meter at the Air Force ba base blew up at over 200 miles an hour. They don't know the forces that were in that. They can estimate, but the devil is getting more and more control of these things. Why? What stops them? Stop through in his tracks. One angel. No, you can't go past this border. Holy angel. Could have stopped those tornadoes up there. One angel. Sent out from the Lord to say, no, but the Holy Spirit is being pushed away. Because we're trusting in what? The arm of flesh. Josiah did that, and he ended up dead. And he didn't die right away, though, did he? Where did he get shot? Remember? He was shot in the heel. His wounds were mortal, but it took him a little while to die. The Lord gave him time to consider his situation. Anyhow, she goes on to say back here in 2 Kings, read the history of Josiah. He had done a good work. During his reign, idolatry was put down and apparently successfully uprooted. The temple was reopened and the sacrificial offerings reestablished. His work was done well, but at last he died in a battle. Why? Because he did not heed the warnings given. Are we heeding the warnings given? Now somebody said in Sabbath school this morning about preparation for the Day of Atonement. Are we preparing for what's coming? Are we heeding these warnings that are being given in nature, in the government, in the church? Or are we making excuses for them and saying, boy, I'm glad I don't live in Alabama. Well, it wasn't just Alabama. It was Texas. It was Oklahoma. It was Missouri, it was Tennessee, and on and on and on, because this didn't just happen last Wednesday and Thursday, folks. This has been going on for a couple of weeks, at least. I could not believe when I saw it. Missouri, a whole neighborhood destroyed. They showed it from the, from the air. It looked like a bomber went over there and dropped a whole bunch of bombs on that town. Did you see it? Did you see the debris, the trees stripped and scattered? I mean, I was looking at it, and I'm looking at what happened in Japan. Ships up out of the water, sitting on land, like somebody came along in a bathtub and went boop with a little toy boat. That doesn't get your attention? Did that ever happen in Japan before? Are we heeding the warnings? Or are we saying, no, I don't want to talk about it. What did Peter say? And what did he end up doing? Oh, that depresses me. Do you suppose Jesus was a little bit depressed when he had to come down here? Did we ever hear about it? No. One time, he said, Lord, I don't want to do this but not your will, my will be done. Jesus was always uplifting and cheering people up and ministering and telling them of the promises. Because Josiah died in battle, 
who will charge God with denying his word that Josiah should go to his grave in peace? The Lord did not give orders for Josiah to make war on the king of Egypt. When the Lord gave the king of Egypt orders that the time had come to serve him by warfare, and the ambassadors told Josiah not to make war with Necho, no doubt Josiah congratulated himself that no word from the Lord had come to him directly. He wasn't a stupid man, was he, Josiah? I think he was manipulating the situation a little bit. Because he was doing what he wanted to do. To turn back with his army would have been humiliating, so he went on. <coughs> and because of this, he was killed in battle, a battle that he should not have had anything to do with. The men who had been so greatly honored, the man who had been so greatly honored by the Lord, did not honor the word of God. The Lord had spoken in his favor predicted good things for him, and Josiah became self-confident and failed to heed the warning. He went against the word of God, choosing to follow his own way, and God could not shield him from the consequences of his act. In this day, in this, our day, men choose to follow their own desires and their own will. Can we be surprised that there is so much spiritual blindness? We need to heed what is going on and not be depressed and upset by it. Disturbed? Yes. We know the solutions. We know the answers. And the biggest portion of the answer is getting our lives in order to deal with this. Was Jesus afraid to be arrested? Was he afraid to go before the Sanhedrin? Was he afraid to go before Pilate? Was he afraid to go to Calvary? It was not important whether he was or not. He overcame it. He was not afraid to discuss it either, as we are. You know why? Because we're comfortable. We have this idea, love, 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 love. Well, we're going to read about love. Where is the love in destroying all those homes up south? Up south, you catch that? <laughs> See, we're deep south, so that's up south. <laughs> but they don't call us deep south. That's deep south. <laughs> that I don't understand. Where, where, where is the love, folks? Hmm. Will those homes be destroyed? Every home one time soon? Will it all be wiped off the planet? Where's all the love? Interesting. I want to read out of Reflecting Christ, page 82. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. 1 Timothy 3.16 Many people seem to be ignorant of what constitutes faith. Now we're back to faith. Many complain of darkness and discouragement. I ask... Are your faces turned towards Jesus? Does it matter what happens on this planet? Does it matter? Did it matter to Jesus? Only one thing mattered to him. What was that? You and me. There were no walls of separation with Jesus. He saw everybody as equal he treated everybody equally. He knew where they were eventually headed. Do you realize just about everybody he dealt with is in the grave right now? And he is not? Should he have been depressed and discouraged over that? As God, he knew when every one of them was going to meet their end. And where? And why? 
Are you beholding him, the son of righteousness? And S-U-N. You need plainly to define to the churches the matter of faith. Entire dependency upon the righteousnesses of Christ. What did she say? Where's the dependency? Christ's merits, Christ's life, Christ's way. We major in the minors. We f worry far too much about what we eat, what we dress, what we watch, rather than getting out and getting the work done. There has been so little dwelling upon Christ, his matchless love, his great sacrifice made in our behalf, that Satan has nearly eclipsed the views we should have and must have of Jesus Christ. You see, the great tragedy that took place up north is how many of those people are going to be cast in the lake of fire because we didn't do our jobs. How many of them will go to perdition because the Seventh-day Adventist church is more worried about being like the world or eating this way or dressing that way rather than getting the message of love out, which is what message? Oh, I've got to accept and love everybody, or how about this world's coming to an end. If you're not right, you're going to be cast in the lake of fire. However, how many of those people are going to turn bitter? How many of those people that are still alive are the devil going to use to go after the faithful and blame them? Remember, this administration says don't let a crisis go to waste. They're going to use it. That's the way of the Jesuit. And instead, what do we see? Black and white. I mean in color. That's all that matters. What must trust, uh, we must trust less in human beings for spiritual help and more, far more, in approaching Jesus Christ as our Redeemer. We may dwell with a determined purpose on the heavenly attributes of Jesus Christ. We may talk of his love, we may tell and sing of his mercies. We may make him our personal savior. Then we are one with Jesus. We love that which Christ loved. We hate sin, that which Christ hated. These things must be talked of, dwelt upon. We are to keep before the mind a sin-pardoning savior. But we are to present him in his true position coming to die to magnify the law of God and to make it honorable. And yet, to justify the sinner who shall depend wholly upon the merits of the blood of the crucified and risen Savior. Is that what the church is putting forth? Jesus came here for what purpose? One purpose. She just said it. What is it? To die... To magnify what? What does that mean? What does that mean? To die to magnify his law. Does that mean that there is a penalty not to magnify his law? Does that mean that there is going to be a price to pay to live as we will? Is that love? That we... Let everybody do as they will and please. All you have to do is be part of us and say, I love you, I love G, I love this, I love that. She goes on to say, The soul-saving message, the third angel's message, is the message to be given to the world. Period. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? But what do we dwell on? What are you eating? What time do you go to bed? What kind of clothes are you wearing? Folks, that's a smoke screen. That's a very deep ditch. Because I'm going to tell you right now, the soul that is 
one with Christ as she describes here is going to be eating the right thing, going to be wearing the right clothes, and going to bed at the right time. It's a given. We major in the minors. Was that important to the Pharisees? You eat at the table with sinners? Was food an issue with them? How many times was food brought up in relationship to Jesus breaking the law? Well, I can think of a couple right off. How about when they were walking through the fields eating? How about when Jesus went to Matthew's house? He's a wine bibber. Do we see that today in the conservative Adventist movement, folks? Didn't they even say, he's not like us? What were they referring to? Their dress, their, their mannerisms, their habits. She says here, now this is the message of love. The soul-saving message, the third angel's message, is the message to be given to the world. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are both important, immensely important, and must be given with equal force and power. The first part of the message has been dwelt upon mostly, the last part casually. The faith of Jesus is not comprehended. Now, we must talk it, we must live it, we must pray it, and educate the people to bring this part of the message into our home life. Why are we afraid of the events that are taking place? Because we don't have the faith of Jesus. What were we warned not to lose? Our shield of faith. Then say, don't worry about losing your vegetables. People arguing over they should eat, whether they should eat eggs or not. Paul mentioned nothing about that. Did say, though, make sure you don't lose your shield of faith. Our prophet tells us today we dwell on the commandments, but we don't dwell on the shield of faith. We're too busy in our lives to be bothered with what happened in Alabama. We're too busy with our lives to worry about a tsunami that hit some land thousands of miles away. We want to come to church and not talk about these things because it's a day of rest and peace. But this is the third angel's message. Should we be doing something about it? I think we should be paying close attention to these things and discussing them as they relate to the closing scenes of Earth's history. Now, let's take a look at somebody in the Bible whose faith was unparalleled in many instances. And that would be the thief on the cross. Now remember she said that we are to not look to ourselves, not look to men, not look to the church. Look to whom? The merits of Christ's righteousness. That would be in Luke 23, verse 39. And one of the malefactors which was hanged railed on him saying, If you be Christ... Save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, seeing you are in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto you, Today you shall be with me in paradise. What just took place here? Did this man 
find his shield of faith? What just took place? Here Jesus is hung on the cross. The very act that he came here for. Now, there are two that are hung with him. What is one worried about? What is the first one worried about? His own self. Correct? Not what he's concerned about? What are people in the church worried about today? Their house, their bank accounts, their jobs, going to church and having fun. And that works both ways. Whether the church is singing and carrying on and or whether you go to the church and they're worried about what's on the table to eat back there. <laughs> you see. Or whether or not they can associate with certain people because they're heathens or they don't worship the way I do. Or we have to be careful what we talk about because we don't want to talk about what's really going on out there in relationship to what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. So what does Sabbath become? So this first guy has had an idea that, hey, if you're Christ, save me and you. Let's get out of here. What did the Pharisees say to him while he was hanging there? What did the leaders of the church say, folks? What did they say? They said the exact same thing. So where did this man get his education from, do you suppose, in religious issues? Who was he trusting in? They said the same thing. Save yourself if you cry. Come down from there. But this guy at least through the fact then that, well, if you do that, you can save me too. At least he said that. See, the second man, however, realized that his life was garbage. He realized that he got himself to a point of death. He realized that everything that he had done up until that point was what? Worthless. Got him hung on a cross. Everything that he did from a little baby, from when he could take responsibility for his own, everything he did led him right to where he was. He realized that. He looked at Christ. And what did he see? A malefactor? An imposter? He had no reason to believe in him because the whole nation was against him. Le le uh, leaders included, the greatly educated, were there saying he was an imposter. The Roman emperor had decided, or not the emperor, the Roman governor had said, we'll kill him too. So the state, the church, the mob all decided that Jesus was worried of death. What made this man see salvation in him? When he had no special treatment, he was hanging right next to him. What did he see? What did he see, folks? What did you say, Nellie? He saw Christ for who he really was. What did Jesus say to Peter when G Peter asked, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say I am? What did Peter say? You're the Christ. You're the Son of God. What did Jesus respond? Who told you? The Holy Spirit told Peter that. So who was working in the mind of this man? How did he recognize him as Christ? How did, forgetting that, this is this man's last deal. Why was he not begging the Romans for mercy and rather going to the man, hanging right next to him? Because the Holy Spirit was at work in that man and he had his shield of faith on. Regardless of what he had done, Jim, bump the ace, make it a little warmer in here.
just a couple bangs there. So anyhow, the Holy Spirit was at work. Why was the Holy Spirit not working on the first man? This is their last opportunity. He was. But what did the first man do? Pushed him away. He mocked him. He believed in the arm of flesh. This other man, he saw him for what he was. He saw him as the Savior. He believed what he said. Now, I don't know what he had just eaten. I don't know, well, I do know somewhat how he was dressed. But he became the salt of the earth because this didn't happen in a bubble. This conversation took place in front of people. The centurion who proclaimed him as surely this must be the son of God after he had died. I suppose the Holy Spirit was at work there too because Jesus said you can only know this. God has told you this, he said to Peter. So faith. She says, commentary here. To the last of his work, Christ is a sin partner. At deepest midnight, as the star of Bethlehem was about to sink into oblivion, lo, there shines amid the moral darkness with distinct brightness the faith of a dying sinner as he lays hold upon a dying Savior. Such faith may be represented by the eleventh hour laborers who receive as much reward as do those who have labored for many hours. The thief asked in faith, in penitence, in contrition. He asked in earnestness as if he fully realized that Jesus could save him if he would. And the hope in his voice was mingled with anguish as he realized that if he did not, he would be lost, eternally lost. He cast his helpless, dying soul and body on Jesus Christ. This is the issue that took place up north. This is the issue that took place in Japan. What did these people know about the Savior? And if they didn't know, whose fault is it? God's or mine? Who's going to be held responsible? Lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. Go do this work. Remember, the armor consists of footwear, doesn't it? What's that for? Go preach the gospel. And if you'll notice, he's not wearing any footwear because he's on, enchant on holy ground. We're to be on holy ground constantly. Uh, this was, uh, Nelly, the uh, commentary under Luke um, 23 verses 41 or 39 through 41 well actually 42 and 43 sure John 3 3 go to John 3 verse 14 and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What is he talking about? Jesus is talking to Nicodemus privately. Nicodemus is supposed to be a teacher and ruler in Israel, and he says to Nicodemus, you don't know any of this stuff. Why? And you're a teacher? You know this, the conversation. But when he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What serpent in the wilderness was lifted up by Moses? When they were being bit. When Aaron made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole. Anybody who looked at it, what would happen? But they had to look at it. Everybody lived, right? Exactly, it was faith. But they all lived, right? No. Many of them died. Why? That stupid pole can't do a thing. But they were supposed to be Seventh-day Adventists. So when we look to Calvary, as this man did, oh, he participated in it, didn't he? The thief. 
that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Does it matter how many homes were destroyed in Alabama? Does it say the homes will have eternal life? The cars? The banks? No. But the people that were destroyed will be destroyed forever if they don't know this. But we don't want to talk about that, do we? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's the verse we quote all the time, right? That is so taken out of context. You know why? You see, because the two verses, before, you have to look and live. Why was Jesus on the cross? Because of sin. What was he magnifying? I read it. His father's law. See, if you leave that out, then, oh, this is wonderful. All I have to do is say, I believe in Jesus and I'm going to have eternal life. I can live how I want. Verse 17. For God sent his son into the world. Uh, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He believed, he that believe on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in his name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, you have the two thieves on the cross. Did one believe? Did the other believe? Well, you see the problem with this is... What the man said and the one malefactor which was hanging real if thou be Christ there's the problem what was the problem what did the devil say to Jesus in the wilderness what was he trying to instill in Jesus at that point doubt what was that taking from him? What was that taking from him? If that shield of faith. Was the devil asking Jesus the same question on the cross that he asked him in the wilderness? Wow. Does he give up? His last few breaths. Devil had him on the cross was ready to stick a spear in his side. If, again, the shield of faith, I want it. If thou be the Christ. This man didn't know. If. The other man said, save me. He knew. There was no doubt. The amazing thing is, did the man that said if have anything to lose to believe? There's still time to change the path you're on. Is that correct? Or once you make a decision, is it sealing yourself one way or the other? What did that man have to lose by saying, save me? Why did he say if? Because his mind was not controlled by the Holy Spirit. It was impossible for him to say that. At that point. We're told we have time to change. Isn't that what we're told? Wow. If thou be the Christ. We need to get our lives in order. And understand who the Christ is. She says here, going back to... Reflecting Christ, I forget the title. 
The soul saving message, the third angel's message, is the message to be given to the world. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are both important, immensely important, and must be given with equal force and power. The first part of the message has been dwelt upon mostly, the last part casually. That's where the if came from. The faith of Jesus is not comprehended. We must talk it. We must live it. We must pray it. And educate the people to bring this part of the message into their home life. Why are our lips so silent upon the subject of Christ's righteousness and his love for the world? Why do we not give to the people that which we revere and quicken them in which uh, they will revere and quicken them into a new life. The Apostle Paul is filled with transport and adoration as he declares, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. The character of Christ is an infinitely perfect character and he must be lifted up he must be brought prominently into view for he is the power the might the sanctification and righteousness of all who believe in him fear not I am with you always even unto the end of the world do we believe that in faith folks the end of the world is just upon us do we believe that we must talk about it. We must deal with it. We must tell people where the answer lies. Yeah, your home might get trashed. You might lose your family. You might lose your own life. Does it matter? One thing matters. Look and live. That's all that matters. And that's the message of love and warning where to give to the world. Anything short of the righteousness of Christ will not be accepted. Larry Sabbath School, Reginald Sabbath School, Dennis Sabbath, been talking about this. When you talk about sanctuary, this is what you're talking about, the righteousness of Christ and the holiness of God and the sacrifice that was made, the blood that was spent. We have to stop playing. We have to see things as they truly are. These are not arbitrary acts that are happening. These are the very things we've been warned about. But Jesus also said, when you see these, don't be alarmed. This is just the beginning. If we can't handle these things, what's going to happen when the real stuff hits the fan? What's going to happen? We will be as this first thief. If, if you be Christ, save me from this. What's going to happen at that point? See the problem? Let us come to grips with it in our own lives. And then we can be used of by God to tell these dear people, it doesn't matter. Oh, it didn't happen to you. Oh, it's going to. We're not safe down here in Florida, folks. It's going to. It's going to, one way or another, it's coming to each one of us with a vengeance that has never been before. Because as you see, the Holy Spirit, the holy angels are doing this now. Why? Because that's what they want to do? Or is it because that's what we ask them to do? It's coming here. And we're either going to be like Paul on the ship in the hurricane, Or we're going to be like Peter on the night of Christ's crucifixion. Or Timothy running out through the dark, naked for fear. They got a second chance at that point. We will not. Jesus said, see to it that you are not alarmed. Because you have to have that shield of faith. I often wonder how Moses and Aaron walked through those storms that took place in Egypt when they went to see Pharaoh. What kind of faith did they have? These are storms that we've never, we can't comprehend. 
even given the things that have just happened. But they went out in it. Because Jesus said, now go talk to Pharaoh. Did it say he paused the chaos while they did it? Did it say that? Go see Pharaoh. He marched the people into the Red Sea. Would you do that? I don't care how solidified those. Would you do that? But you know, he prepared their minds for that. He didn't just say, okay, we're, and he could have. He could have said, Moses, go get him. We're going to leave in two hours, okay? I don't even need to talk to Pharaoh. Just two hours. I want you out there. He didn't need to go through all that with Pharaoh. Did God need to do that to get those people released? All he had to do was say, do it. And it would have been, he could have sent angels to hold the whole Egyptian country, put them in one place, hold them right there while the Israelites left. Now, how do you suppose they would have reacted when they came up to the Red Sea? I'm not going down there. They just saw the hand of God working, didn't they? It was nothing for them. We take these things for granted as little things, as nothing things, as things that really have nothing to do with us or we don't think about it. You walk 5,000 feet down in an ocean bed while the waves and the water's being held back. Would you be a little apprehensive? And what rage stirred Pharaoh on that he ordered his troops down in there? You see the supernatural working on both sides of the coin. You see the great faith that Israel had to have. And you see the great rage that those who rejected the message, the third angel's message that the Lord sent to Egypt through Moses, after they felt they were defeated. Why did he go order his men down in there? Would you go in there? <laughs> what did he think was the devil had deceived Pharaoh, who was, again, not a stupid man, Man's wisdom, so they think it's his wisdom, the devil had deceived him into believing that those walls of water were going to stay there long enough for him to go kill those people. Think about that. It doesn't make sense, does it? This is a trap set up by the enemy, so to speak, as far as Pharaoh is concerned. And he walked right into it, both eyes wide open. The rage of the devil, the deception. I don't know what he saw in his mind's eye. I don't know how blinded he was. But the Lord is going to lead us up, folks, into these situations that are going to get worse and worse and worse. However, we're going to have to walk right through the storm. And if we can't talk about it, how are we going to do that? as it relates to prophecy and scripture and getting this third angel's message out. Remember what we read in Zechariah two weeks ago about the weakest becoming like what? What was David afraid of? Nothing. Nothing. Not even giants. But it's interesting. He was very close to the Lord. Had problems, he had issues, but God said he was a man after his own mind. David? <laughs> Go figure. So we can become like that. But David never ran from a fight, did he? When he was led to, he left. But David, when he saw situations, and, and, and this is always something that's always gone over. Israel had the greatest period of peace in their history under David than any other time. Than any other time. Because the surrounding nations did not want to see David's army on a battlefield because they knew what it meant. But he had turmoil within, didn't he? Isn't that interesting? He had turmoil with it. So we need to come to grips with these things behind the shield of faith. We need to understand that 
We're at a point in history where the news is going to keep getting worse and worse. But I want to see it through the Lord's eyes, not through Fox or CNN's eyes. Because the Lord tells me the truth. And I can have faith in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your plain word of truth. We thank you, Lord, for comfort that no matter what, you are with us always, but we must be with you first, Father. Help us to have the faith that is necessary to, one, get this work done, and two, to see you returning in the clouds. Help us, Lord, to overcome, to unite as an army is terrible with banners, Father, and to go out and to spread this saving message. Please be with us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.